Well, thank you, and thanks for inviting me. It's lovely to be speaking to you in this spectacular theater. I can't help but remember what my friend and hero, Deborah Meyer, said, that once, as a society, we, we embraced schools, we loved and respected and adored them, and as a result, created grand facilities like the ones in which we're meeting today. We know what to do. We know how to make schools more productive contexts for learning. We often behave as if we don't. And we continue to invent things and ideas which already exist each time with diminished expectations. But what would happen if we woke up every morning and asked ourselves the question, how can I make this the best seven hours of a kid's life? From there, everything else becomes easy. If you're committed to this vision of education, which is about amplifying human potential, about increasing opportunities, about allowing kids to go further than they could go on their own, then we're well on our way to creating those productive contexts for experience. One of the ideas that's really been driving my work for the past several years came from a statement made by Dr. Leon Botstein, the president of Bard College in upstate New York. Botstein said something in a completely different context, which really shook me and has inspired me to thinking in several books that I'm working on. And what he said was that young people have a remarkable capacity for intensity. Young people have a remarkable capacity for intensity. And it's incumbent upon us as educators, as parents, as citizens, to build upon that remarkable capacity for intensity. Otherwise, it manifests itself as misbehavior, or ennui, or boredom, or perhaps, worst of all, lost potential. You have to remember, ladies and gentlemen, the years in which kids are in your classroom is when they become lawyers, and philosophers, and dentists, and mathematicians, and computer scientists, and poets, and artists, and composers. Bill Gates told Stephen Levy in Wired Magazine, I was fully formed as a programmer by 17. And look at him now, he single-handedly dismantled public education. <laughs> it's incumbent upon us to build upon a smart more capacity for intensity um, because schools should be more intense. They shouldn't be mind-numbing, soul-killing places. Now, we shouldn't confuse chaos with intensity. Schools are good at chaos. They're not so good at intensity. I'm not surprised when kids do extraordinary things. I've come to expect it. I'm surprised when adults are surprised that kids are capable of doing extraordinary things. What I've noticed, though, in the schools where I have an opportunity to work around the world is I often feel like Rip Van Winkle. I woke up from a, sl a slumber and recognized that the entire world had shifted wholesale to nothing but whole-class instruction. And what that means is, we have a generation of teachers who have been prepared to, for the classroom by being taught animal control and curriculum delivery. I came at the tail end of a generation who, in order to become an elementary school teacher, had to learn how to make puppets out of Pop-Tart boxes and play the piano a little bit and teach phys ed and science. And now a lot of those things that really make us human, that really make the classroom somewhere that kids can't wait to return to, where the work that they engage in is purposeful and life-changing, that's all disappeared because even if the teacher isn't lecturing from bell to bell with full frontal teaching, we've increased the physical distance between teacher and learner. We've increased the emotional distance. It's, it's harder to check for understanding. We're depriving kids of agency. We're, we're involved in, trans every time there's a transition between the 13 minute unit of study on something when we go from language arts to math to social studies and we don't connect anything in any, any meaningful whole or through any kind of authentic project experience, there's this transition time that's wasted. We kill flow, the opportunity to lose yourself in something, to become really good at something. And even the idea of settle down time bothers me. Because if you're not lecturing from bell to bell, you're still controlling everything that happens in the classroom, which means that you've eliminated serendipity. And settle down time means wait for the next instruction. And I had an experience recently in a class where in the settle down time, I was sitting at a little desk in a little chair with my laptop open, and I wrote a computer program, I annotated it, I printed it out, and I handed it to several kids, all in the time that was spent the teacher shushing the class. And I was every so often elbowing the kid next to me to point that out. Why does a kid need to be told what to do when they return from, 
from break or lunch or from another subject? Why don't they know what to do? Why isn't there something purposeful for them to do? So I'm going to share some examples of kids doing things with computers because I think computers are wonderful intellectual laboratories and vehicles for self-expression. They amplify human potential. If knowledge is a consequence of experience and the project is the basic unit of knowledge construction, then computers increase the breadth and depth and range of projects that are possible. So this is Hugo. Hugo was in the fifth grade. He built a little robot car that when he clapped his hands, the car would start moving, he clapped his hands again, it would stop. And he had to deal with tolerances and ambient, controlling for ambient noise. He had to deal with inequality. You know, we teach inequality and inequality in school, and if you ask kids to actually use greater than and less than, this is what you get. Is it the alligator with the mouth open? Or the alligator with the mouth closed? They have no actual working knowledge of it. School is the only place in life where anything equals anything else. Inequality is incredibly important because you're always off by a little. So being able to control for the clap is really good. I got involved in working with some other kids, and Hugo had gone on to change his program. He got a clipboard, a piece of paper, he had a calculator under a cherry, he had a yardstick, because here in the United States we're still taking weight and seeing that whole metric deal. And he had changed his program so that when he clapped his hands, the car would go for one second, and he would write how far it traveled, and then he would try it over and over again. He knew about successive trials, even though it wasn't taught in school. What was he trying to accomplish? I know as a teacher, whose job it is primarily to make the thinking of kids, um, you know, to make private thinking public, to make the invisible thinking visible, I understood that he was trying to figure out how quickly his car was traveling. Now that's typically where the fun and games ends and several years of torturous unit conversions begin. Because when I asked you to convert 31 inches per second to miles per hour, you would run screaming from this auditorium. And yet I opened my laptop and went to wolframalpha.com and typed 31 inches per second, and it not only told me how many miles per hour that was, which was 1.76 miles per hour, but we got this little extra bonus I hadn't anticipated. He said that's 0.7 of the typical human walking speed of 2.5 miles per hour. Before I could say another word, Hugo was back to work on his project because he wanted to make it go faster than a human. And for those of you who would suggest using Wolf Alpha in this context is, is cheating, if I look out at this audience, I recognize that about 40% of you are wearing eyeglasses, you cheaters. <laughs> now can we please move past the canard that what happens if all the batteries in the universe disappear and the solar calculators can't be charged because something is blocking the rays of the sun? Well, if that's the case, you probably should attend to the pending apocalypse and set away from that. But the big idea here is that if you make simple things easy to do, you make complexity possible. When we allow the learner to know what they need to know, when they need to know it, they're able to learn more complex things. Right? Fractions. We torture kids with this nonsense for years. What if you walked into a fifth grade class and said to the kids, write a program that draws any fraction I type in as parts of a circle, and in my case, I said, and if you solve the problem first, I'll take you to lunch, not knowing if that was allowed. The kids said, can we work together? I said, sure. Three little girls wrote this program. And I said, I was going to test it over multiple, you know, numerators and denominators. Here, they're not just learning vocabulary or that a circle is, is a, or that a fraction is a pizza. They're writing a computer program. They're doing computer science and debugging and variables and radius and diameter and and a whole bunch of other concepts, all in the service of learning something that we teach them and we teach them and we teach them, but they don't always stay taught. Now I found over the years that in my work of advocating project-based learning and in my work with kids with computers, that sure they could compose a symphony to explain Lady Macbeth in an English class, even though they had never composed music before. Sure they could build a dancing ballerina out of robotics materials when they're fifth, five years old and choreograph it. And, do, and make movies and do all these wondrous things. How was it possible they were able to do that in just a few hours or days when traditionally this wouldn't be possible with a two-year scope and sequence? And I formed a pedagog pedagogical hypothesis that I, that I call a good problem worth a thousand words, which says that if you have a good prompt, challenge, problem, or motivation, appropriate materials, sufficient time, and a supportive culture that includes a range of expertise, you can solve problems that are bigger than yourself. So here's a problem. Build a robot that when I push the button, it's going to go from the starting line to the finish line on the table and end as close to the finish line as it can. 
And this is third graders who are working with their computers and the robotics materials for about three days. <laughs> and they were able to solve that problem. Now if you Google MIT third year engineering challenge, it looks an awful lot like that. And the reaction is quite similar. <laughs> Now the best, the best problem solving comes from inquiry, comes from questions that kids want to answer, things they want to know. But sometimes we have to teach stuff, right? So we have to come up with a prompt for the kids. And the thing you have to understand about prompts is it has to be a good prompt. It has to be something you can sink your teeth into, something you can get your arms around, something that's meaningful. Even if only to learn that this is more complicated than I thought it was. If you as a teacher need to set a prompt, it needs to have three elements. One, brevity, you should fit on a post-it note. Two, ambiguity. I didn't say build something with four motors and four wheels and three gears and 75 lines of code. I said make a machine that'll get from the starting line to the finish line and I need to be done in practice on the track. If, if one kid had figured out a way to build a vehicle that would circumnavigate the globe and land on the finish line, they learned a lot more than my curricular objectives, didn't they? Why would I limit that? And the last element is immunity to assessment. The best projects push up against the persistence of reality. What's a B plus in a poem, or an A minus in a musical composition, or an 87 when you're building a robot? Now I've been in a lot of conferences recently where I've seen people present really interesting stuff they've done with kids. And it's always the same story. I did something for a week or two, or for 20 hours, and look at how test scores went up. Well, if that's the case, then it's a lot easier than we thought, isn't it? And I've been asking myself, what if we actually did things with kids in schools that lasted longer than a dose of an antibiotic? What if kids could actually become good at something? What would that look like? Is deep learning possible? Angela Petrie, one of my favorite education philosophers, said, I do not remember the school ever staying with a beautiful idea long enough to have it become part of children's lives. He said that in 1917 as a principal of a school here in New York City. We can't, ladies and gentlemen, believe that children are competent if we behave as if their teachers are incompetent. That's why I created the Constructing Modern Knowledge Institute, where teachers have the ability to spend four days learning what it's like to learn with the wondrous materials of the 21st century, where they can explore Islamic tiling and make connections across a variety of disciplines, where Rick Weinberg can write on the wall the first day of four that I want to build an iPhone charger that will charge my iPhone when I ride my bike to work. And instead of me saying to him, that's a batshit crazy idea, I said, go ahead. And the second day, someone brought in a, a bicycle for him after he built a little prototype that showed promise. And by the fourth day, he was charging his iPhone with a generator made entirely of Lego and string. And when someone said, oh, so you're an engineer, right? He said, no, social studies teacher. <laughs> or the teachers who built an Edison phonograph and had to learn how to engineer and build this thing and then went on to amp learn to amp record and amplify the sound so they could hear it play back. And when they heard it played for the first time, the teacher said, and I quote, Oh my God, I saw Eleanor Roosevelt. And then she said, I'm a good teacher and I like to think that I use primary sources to play kids' movie reels of great people in history. It never occurred to me that maybe Eleanor Roosevelt didn't sound like Eleanor Roosevelt. Maybe she sounded that way because of the recording technology of her time. And they made movies and they compared and contrasted what Steve Jobs said about the promise of the iPad education to the exact same claims that Edison made for the phonograph. And they connected a million disciplines and learned 25 years with a PD all in the four days based on having the opportunity to make something. The message I want to share with all of you is less us, more them. Whenever we have the opportunity to make a quest, to, to intervene on behalf of some educational transaction, we need to take a deep breath and ask ourselves, is there less that we can do and more that the kids can do? Can we shift more agency to the learner? And for those of you, ladies and gentlemen, who are educators, and I applaud and salute the work that you do every year, every day, on behalf of the children you serve. If you're old enough to remember baking cookies and singing songs, and nature walks, and gerbils, and classroom centers, and meaningful projects, and science experiments, and Cuisinier rods, you have an obligation to return those materials and experiences to your classroom Monday. Not just for the kids, that you're privileged to serve, but for your colleagues, a generation of colleagues who don't know that's possible and rely on you to set an example. Those of us who know better need to do better. Thank you very much.